really enjoyed your talk this morning at WARE, and I wanted to just ask you about a couple of the key concepts from it. But um, I was really interested in a couple of the statements that you made, which you acknowledged in the talk seemed obvious on first glance, but then really have some more depth to them. And one of them was that you really need to start designing with a goal. And I'm curious, um, why is that so deep? And what are the kinds of goals people might start with? So in the early phase, when you're just playing with your data, maybe you're not sure what's there, maybe you're not sure what you're going to do with it, you don't need a goal. You can just play with it and run it through whatever tools and try different things. Later on, when you want to communicate it to somebody, you need to know what it is you're attempting to communicate if you want to be successful. And the best goals, the best statements of goals, or the best uh, phrasings of goals are specific enough that they give you some guidance. They actually uh, become a little one sentence or two sentence design spec about what you're going to build. And they might tell you um, what data you want to include, which also means that they're going to tell you what data is not going to be relevant for this conversation. They're going to tell you what the relationships are that you're interested in. And they're going to give you some boundaries in terms of time, space, number of data points, whatever it is that's going to constrain so you're not trying to display the whole world right. for all of time. And having that spec'd out lets you evaluate your success. So. Right, exactly. It, 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 it helps you at the beginning where it tells you what to include and what relationships you want to focus on. And it helps you at the end and then it gives you a destination. It gives you a target that you can test what you've created against and say, did we in fact meet this goal to communicate this particular specification of things. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one example that I mentioned in the talk might be, for example, if we're looking at uh, malaria in Nigeria, we might want to say we want to see a map of rainfall and incidence of malaria in all the districts on a per district basis for the last three years. Mm -hmm. And that gives us some finite constraints. We're not looking at all of history. We're not looking at all of Africa. We're not looking uh, at a particular um, we are looking at a particular focus level, right? So we don't have to go more fine-grained than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're only looking at these two particular factors, right? We don't necessarily need to look at, uh, this is not the map to look at for other related factors. We're just going to look at rainfall and, and, and new cases of malaria. Mm -hmm. So there's enough specificity there to literally specify what it is we're doing. Right. But conspicuously missing from that list is any kind of format or uh, preconceived notion of structure, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's very important because uh, depending on what it is that you're trying to communicate, you may or may not choose to go with uh, a standard format. So in this case, a standard map might be nice, but there certainly are situations where um, a geographically accurate map is less useful because we're less concerned with geographical distribution maybe and we're more concerned with uh, relationships or influence or things that don't map directly to real estate. Right. That makes sense. Um, so another uh, concept that you talked about that maybe seems obvious at first glance is the use of color. And mm -hmm. you made a statement echoing, I think, more at Stefana or saying, color is hard. Color is hard, yeah. Color is difficult. Yeah. And uh, it's difficult for uh, somewhere between two and three reasons. Um, the partial reason is you, you always have to worry about people who are colorblind. And so we, we very commonly want to do red-green, and that's uh, for something like 7% of the population, that's going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. So that's a minor issue with color. The two major issues with color that people uh, get wrong consistently, um, one of which is we, we attempt to use color um, for things that are ordered, mm -hmm. that, that we uh, assign a, a rainbow spectrum of colors to show a range of values. And you'll see this on um, uh, like medical scans where they've added, they've added color um, to you know different values of whatever it is that they're looking for in a brain scan. Mm -hmm. You see it in um, obviously in temperature, which is one that's maybe sort of defensible, but it's also often used in altitude. Uh, it's also often used for you know intensity of storms or depth of snowfall or like all kinds of things. And you go through this this bright bright spectrum, and you've got mm -hmm. purples and magentas and and greens and blues and yellows and oranges and uh, if it's something that we have a pretty strong cultural convention around, like, like temperature, where we know red is hot and we know blue is cold and we know green's in the middle, and that's well enough defined and there's enough of a conversation around it, you can maybe assume that people are going to get that right. But when you're trying to map that to altitude or brain intensity or something else, it's very difficult to do that in a way that people understand because the, because the sequence of colors, although it is a physical reality, it's not something that our brain acknowledges and perceives as an ordered sequence. 
And by an ordered sequence, you mean, I mean, most people think of a rainbow order of colors, but you mean by comparison? By comparison, you can't give somebody a, a, an altitude map if there's no, um, if there's no scale, if there's no legend to it, they may not know if purple or yellow is taller, mm -hmm. or is more brain activity, or is more something else. Okay. Uh, so, so that's a problem. Whereas you can say, um, we're going to do a gradient where we're going to show sea level is white, and then the beach is tan, and the foothills are light brown, and the taller the mountain gets, the darker brown it gets. And then going down into the water, the very pale water is light blue, and as you go deeper and deeper, you get darker and darker blue. Mm -hmm. And what we're, we're not cycling through a rainbow there. Instead, we're either varying the saturation or the brightness of one color. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is something our brain is very good at making comparisons. We can do lighter and darker. We can't say that's twice as light or twice as dark. That's, um, that's more difficult. You can't quantify with color in that way or with intensity that way. Mm -hmm. But you can definitely get uh, um, relative ordering, ranking. <coughs> and then uh, the other main issue that's very difficult with color is color has so much implicit meaning culturally mm -hmm. in terms of flags and nationality, in terms of associations with religion, um, uh, pink and blue for children. Um, uh, there are colors associated with holidays. If you're wearing orange and black, it looks like Halloween. If you're wearing right. green and white and red, it looks like Christmas. Uh, but, there's, but there's also the cultural associations. And the example I gave in the talk was uh, a new junior developer was given the task of developing a dashboard for system status. And the dashboard comes up and everything's red. And people were worried, what's wrong? <laughs> is the system broken? Are, are the machines down? And the developer says, no, red means good luck. This is perfect. That's what it's supposed to look like. You can't depend on those interpretations being consistent for a given audience. And uh, the mistake that is often made is that people don't think about the implications because they know what it means. Mm -hmm. It means something to them. Right. And you can't depend on that being universal for everyone you put it in front of. But knowing your audience and designing to your audience and their sort of cultural expectations makes a big difference there. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, uh, and that's... Uh, that applies to almost any design thing you can you can think of. Whether you're designing physical devices and you want it to be readable to audiences who maybe have different eyesight, um, uh, uh, print in books. Children's books are very large, so that children can learn the shape of the letters, right? But then you also have larger print for people who who have difficulty, you know, seeing smaller print later on. Um, uh, any kind of thing that you're designing for someone who is not you to consume, whether it's an information product, a physical utility, whatever it is, understanding their needs, their constraints, their jargon, how much time they have, all of these things are going to allow you to create a product that's going to be more successful. Right. And your success is defined by the success of your customer. So uh, you got this really great question uh, as part of the session, which I think has a lot of room to unpack it. But just to give us a little taste of the answer you gave in the session and, and where that might lead. Why, why is it that people get some of these very simple things so wrong? Like, why do we see work that appears to be, have so much room for improvement? Fundamentally, I think technology specifically and business in general is still learning this lesson mm -hmm. about really understanding the needs of their audience and is still, um, is still struggling with some old concepts about add more features, add more capability, that's what people want instead of really understanding how people operate, mm. uh, both at the at the level of what do people need to get their work done, but also how do people operate in terms of how do they perceive color, mm. right? How do they perceive shape, and and these lessons, uh, these these designing for human beings, designing for your customers' lessons are trickling into industry for sure, um, but slowly, and uh, people learn from their peers, people learn from their tools. Right. And if the previous generation who built the tools that you learned from didn't have that insight, you're not going to learn it either from mm -hmm. your tools. It's, it's this intentionality of design has to be uh, undertaken as, as, um, as its own pursuit yeah. on top of whatever else, whether you're doing maps, whether you're doing industrial design, whether you write software, choosing to uh, craft a superior solution for whoever your customer is, is something you have to do intentionally. And when you say that we learn from our tools, you mean because they include default settings and they include ways of doing right. things that exactly. guide us into certain results. Exactly. Uh, most of the graphs you see out in the world, somebody uh, selected some cells in Excel and clicked the graph button and they're done. Right. And that's what a graph looks like to them. Yeah. And no one ever talked to them about best practices in terms of showing the zero on your vertical axis. No one ever talked about why 3D is a bad way to represent your data. Mm -hmm. No one talked about good color choices, good labeling choices. Uh, those conversations mostly don't happen unless you're someone who's chosen to go pursue that for the most part. And so 
uh, if, if every graph you've ever seen has come from Excel, that doesn't look wrong to you, mm. right? Um, and so there's no impetus there to change. That if, if you don't have the knowledge to say, this isn't good enough, right. you'll never make the effort to do that. So how can we make that better? Do we need better <coughs> tools? Do we just need more exposure to good work? Um, both of those, I think, are really important. The tools are definitely getting better. Mm -hmm. the, the, for, uh, for visualization, for mapping, um, the, the tools are getting better and it, gets, it, it is becoming easier to do good work. And, and uh, to your other point, exactly, you're right on, exposure to good work. And people, uh, even people who, who maybe come into it um, who don't have a lot of, of training mm -hmm. can look at a bad solution and a good solution and, and some subset of people are going to say, you know, that one's better. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be able to tell. And they may not even be able to put their finger on why exactly, but they're going to be able to say, I was able to find my information easier on this. Mm -hmm. And some, some fraction of those people is going to say, I wonder why. What is it? How did they make that better? Because I want to be more successful. Or maybe I'm just curious. But, but somehow, people, uh, some people are going to get inspired Mm. to go learn mm -hmm. and uh, and maybe they teach or maybe they then just produce superior products and uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of inspiring by success right Apple has changed the world in the last decade in terms of business and technology understanding that design matters yeah. because there was never a, uh, there was never a proof of concept that was so successful and so dramatically different from its peers as Apple has been in the last decade and they've not done it through overwhelming technology. They've not done it by undercutting everybody on price. Right. They've done it by providing a solution that people enjoy more. Mm. Inspired learning. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you very much.